Welcome to this video series about measuring value creation in private equity, where we look at how things like leverage, company performance, and market trends drive private equity returns. My name is Mike Reinert. I've worked in the industry for 15 years. I run a private equity math website, Auxilia Mathematica, and I wrote a book titled Private Equity Value Creation Analysis. These videos cover findings from my work website and book, and they're designed for private equity practitioners who use data to raise capital or evaluate the returns of private equity deals, funds, GPs, and investment programs. If it's helpful to you, subscribe and check out the website where you can download the Excel models behind every episode. This first video of EC101 is an overview of private equity value creation models. It'll be more focused on concepts compared to the following videos where we look at actual equations and spreadsheets used by GPs, LPs, and academics. After covering the most popular approaches, we'll introduce a new one that could usually give more consistent and meaningful results over a wider range of investment scenarios. So what is value creation analysis? It's a mathematical framework that measures how changes in company P&Ls, balance sheets, valuations, and broader market forces drive private equity returns. It's something a GP might feature in a case study, perhaps in a fundraising deck, because it highlights compelling aspects of their strategy or track record. LPs often use some version of it to evaluate or monitor GPs, and there have been various academic studies using it to understand broader industry dynamics. Here's how it works. Let's say a GP invests $100 million into a portfolio company. After a few years, they sell it and return exit proceeds of $200 million. Value creation would simply be that $100 million difference. Value creation analysis, on the other hand, this is an explanation of why that $100 million change happened. Here it's broken into EBITDA growth, multiple expansion, and some measurement of the company's debt level. You can see why it's called a value bridge. The three value drivers bridge the gap between invested and realized equity. So it makes a great chart, but there are a few problems with it. First, there is no official standard, and slight variations in the formulas or different ways of setting up the inputs can drive big differences in the results. Further, and this is the most important point, most of these models fail to correctly address the influence of leverage and growth equity. They are reliable if and only if a company's net debt is around zero. Adding leverage or growth capital skews the numbers, and the further net debt moves from zero, the more wrong the analysis will be. In these videos, we'll show you how to fix that, and believe it or not, it's much easier than most people imagine. Okay, why bother? Why is this worth the effort? Well, these value bridges are relevant because much of the interaction between private equity GPs and their LP investors involves stories about companies. The latest realized returns don't paint the full picture when deals take 5 or 10 years to return capital. So those of us who market GPs or evaluate GPs, we're often looking for patterns that demonstrate investment managers do what they say they do. And these patterns are presented as qualitative narratives. They are war stories about how deals are sourced, prices paid, how businesses are improved, management transitions, operating partners, exit processes, and so forth. Now, these value creation models, when they're done well, they can add meaningful quantitative insights that tell you whether or not those war stories are supported by the numbers. Here's an example with 20 different value drivers. That's more than you probably need, but the math behind this is easier than you probably imagine. You only need nine metrics to make this chart. The first three are GP equity, total shareholder equity, and net debt. This gives you seven value drivers. And then from the company's P&L, you take revenue, gross profit, and EBITDA. That'll give you another six. The last seven value drivers come from three market metrics. Percent growth in a company's addressable market, market valuation multiples, and the debt level for the typical sector peer. If you want to see how this works, you can download the Excel model from my website. Here, I'll just highlight how the value drivers can help quantify those GP fundraising narratives. Let's say the GP only invests in companies whose end markets are growing by 3 or 5%. In this case, you should see a consistent pattern of positive value creation here in the addressable market growth. What if the GP claims that sales execution is core to every value creation strategy because they focus on professionalizing company sales forces and building channel partnerships? Then you should see significant value creation coming from market share growth in most deals, and this should be a positive number regardless of whether the company's end market is expanding or contracting. If the GP claims to have a strong operational focus, then expect to see a pattern of positive value creation over here in the EBITDA margin. This deal has modest EBITDA margin expansion of $18 million, but we can drill down further and see its underlying mechanics. The company actually generates $92 million of value from gross margin expansion because there's a decrease in COGS as a percentage of revenue. Unfortunately, most of this gets wiped out by $76 million of negative operating margin reduction because there's an increase in SG&A as a percentage of revenue. That highlights some of the P&L driven value creation, but what if the GP claims to have a deal structuring advantage? 
For example, they usually invest with participating preferred securities. This should cause the GP to often own a higher percentage of company equity at exit compared to entry. And this would reveal itself as a pattern of positive value creation from fund ownership impact. Here, fund ownership impact is negative, which indicates dilution. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It often happens in successful deals where management option pools kick in and expand. Okay, next we turn to the total leverage effect, which represents one of the most important advances of this model. It includes the cash flow generation term, which is simply the change in net debt found in most of the conventional value creation bridges. If you want, you could split up cash flow generation to measure the impact of interest payments and the debt tax shield. Many researchers do that. However, this still would not account for debt's amplification of equity gains and losses. For that, you'd need gearing. This addresses the fact that in levered deals, when enterprise values change, equity values change more, either positively or negatively. Gearing also accounts for growth equity on the balance sheet, which for a given enterprise value change makes equity values change less. Most models fail to address this fundamental value driver. Now, because this model quantifies gearing down to the dollar, we can make hypothetical comparisons to competitors. For example, buyout deals usually have more debt than publicly or family-held peers. So you can ask, how much gearing would there have been if the company only had as much debt as the typical sector competitor? You see the answer here in sector gearing, and then this excess gearing term quantifies how much extra gain or loss was driven by the fact the company had a different debt level. Speaking of the market, most models usually include some form of multiple expansion, and so do we. Here we break multiple expansion into a market-driven component and a company-specific component called intrinsic multiple expansion. You would expect positive intrinsic multiple expansion if the GP buys below market, sells to a strategic, accelerates the growth rate, or materially improves the quality of a company's revenue or earnings. In this case, it's negative, which means the company didn't completely ride the market valuation wave, and it's something you might see if a GP slightly overpays at entry. By the way, if a company's unrealized, this intrinsic multiple expansion term can give you some insight into whether the valuation is reasonable. We mentioned three market or sector value drivers so far. They are addressable market growth, market multiple expansion, and sector gearing. We could add these up to create a new value driver called the market-driven return. This is very similar to what you might get from a public market equivalence or PME analysis, but in a lot of ways, this is better than PME because PME is a top-down measurement of opportunity cost, the return you could have achieved if you invested into something else. Here we have a bottom-up measurement of how the market influenced the company's P&L, valuation, and capital structure, and therefore its returns. This gives you a lot more control in tailoring market metrics to a specific investment size, type, or industry. And believe it or not, the math is easier than PME because you don't have to deal with cash flow spreadsheets and index data. Later videos will discuss precisely how PME and this approach compare to one another. So that is a brief overview of how you might use an analysis like this to test or demonstrate the validity of GP war stories. There are other components that we could add, for exchange rates or the impact of GP management fees, expenses, and carried interest on deals, and we'll cover that in later videos. I'll just highlight one more thing before we wrap up. If you look at the value bridge below, the capital going into the deal and coming out of the deal, these are objectively true. They match dollars transferred between the bank accounts of buyers, sellers, and other stakeholders. Total value creation must also be objectively true because it's simply the difference between two objectively true things. In contrast, the way that value creation gets split up, this is always a subjective interpretation. As we mentioned earlier, different approaches and different assumptions can provide different results. In these videos, I'll argue that even though every value bridge is subjective, some subjective interpretations are objectively better than others, and the criteria for what makes a model objectively superior will be as follows. Number one, a value bridge is objectively better if it uses rigorous math. This means that you can drive all the equations from the bottom up using basic algebra, calculus, and widely accepted capital structure valuation and P&L relationships. You don't need plugs or shortcuts to make the value drivers add up to the right number, and you can break the value drivers into smaller pieces and add them back up again without any loss of data integrity. Number two, approaches are objectively better if the inputs, the numbers that you feed into your equations and spreadsheets, are practical and accessible. This means that you can drive the analysis with numbers usually found in a fund's quarterly report, and you rarely need to make special requests to GPs and deal teams for data. You don't need custom market comp sets for every company, and generally, you don't drive models with cash flow spreadsheets, which are a pain because they don't scale. And number three, approaches are objectively better if the results are non-volatile. So outputs are insensitive to minor fluctuations in inputs, and the models work over the widest range of investment scenarios. 
It doesn't matter if a deal is realized or unrealized, levered or growth, 10x or 0.1x, software or manufacturing, US, Europe, anywhere else. The results make sense and the numbers don't change drastically in two quarters because of a minor change in an EBITDA margin or a GP ownership percentage. The value creation models that we demonstrate on the site and in the book, they have all these characteristics, but it's going to take a few videos for me to make that case. Thanks for watching. If you're into this sort of thing, subscribe and check out the website, Auxilia Mathematica. Registration is free and allows you to download Microsoft Excel files with all the data and charts used in these and other videos. On the site, you'll also find other resources like articles, templates, and a private forum for Q&A. When you visit, check out the site's free online value creation calculators. These web pages allow you to select various analysis parameters, plug in your own capital structure, P&L, and market data, and then measure value creation with a click of a button. I don't think that these calculators will replace your Excel models, but they're really useful for both preliminary investigations and double checking that your own spreadsheets are generating the right numbers. I should mention that if you're looking for a convenient reference and training tool with a form factor of a college text, make sure to check out my book, Private Equity Value Creation Analysis on Amazon.com. And finally, if you'd like to get up to speed with models like this more quickly than the book or the website allow, get in touch. Over the last 15 years, I've helped dozens of GPs build models like this for various fundraising and investor relations projects. Thanks for watching and see you next time.